and welcome to episode 107 of On The Ledge podcast. Whether your house plants number just one or 100 or maybe even 1000, I am here to help and inspire you to make your plants happy. I'm back from my break. I bet you're glad to hear my voice. Well, I hope you are anyway. It's been an exciting week so far. I got my Royal Horticultural Society Level 2 Certificate in Horticulture exam results for the first half of the course. And I'm delighted to say that I passed and I even got a commendation. I am very happy. In fact, I might go as far as to say, yeehaw! Or for the English listeners, oh, well, yes, that's very good. I'm very happy about that. Thank you. Anyway, enough tooting of my own trumpet. In this week's episode, I will be giving you an update on how my houseplants have done uh, when they've been left home alone for two weeks. And I'll also be extolling the delights of one of my favourite houseplants, Oxalis triangularis. And I'll be answering a listener question about something rotten at the heart of a bird's nest fern. While I've been away, several of you have left lovely reviews for me on your pod app of choice. Thanks to Red Annie, who says that On The Ledge is the perfect drive time length obsession. Annie is new to plants and was looking for some extra help in learning about things green and indoors and stumbled upon On The Ledge. They say, so good, covers everything I've been wondering about and more. Jenny Loves Nature described On The Ledge as an upbeat podcast about everything houseplant. And apparently I'm a lovely host. Thank you. And Jenny Loves Nature loves the way the show brings together listeners of all ages from across the world to share the houseplant love. I am loving that description. That's exactly what I had in mind. Thank you, Jenny Loves Nature. And Whirlyboy4321 loves how I stay specifically on the topic of houseplants. Whirly says that they have listened to a few other podcasts, but they tend to go off on tangents about their lives or non-houseplant topics and can be a bit long-winded. Jane is succinct, but not rushed at all. Oh, thank you, Whirlyboy4321. Um, just, just hang on a minute while I uh, get rid of this lengthy anecdote about Wolfie in this week's episode, OK? Just just give me a minute. Yeah, OK. Right, let's go on. And after listening to episode 105 about houseplants for beginners, Dan got in touch to tell me that he has actually seen Crassula ovata ogre's ears in the flesh, which was very exciting because this is a plant, as I said in the episode, that I haven't actually seen in person before. Dan writes, I hadn't either until I visited a friend of a friend that has a huge one. Needless to say, I went home with some and now have a few little ones. Lucky you, Dan. I'm feeling very jealous. And how exciting when you get to see a plant that you've been wondering and dreaming about for so long in the flesh. Usually it's not a disappointment, but occasionally it might be. And even better when you can take home some cuttings. Well done to the friend of a friend. And finally, Sandy got in touch with a very, very useful top tip to deal with my issue with converting centigrade to Fahrenheit. And Sandy says the easiest way to convert is if it's 25 centigrade, then do 25 times 2 plus 30. So 25 centigrade is more or less 80 degrees Fahrenheit, probably a bit less. So let's work this out. So if it was 10 degrees centigrade, it would be... 10 times 2, 20, plus 30, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just going to check. Just, let's do. Let's just check that's actually right. Uh, 10 C to F computer. Can you? Yes, it works. Awesome, Sandy. Thanks very much. And helpfully, Sandy also provides the conversion back the other way for those Americans who struggle to get Fahrenheit back into centigrade. So if it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's... 100, take away 30, divided by 2. So 35 degrees centigrade. That really does work. So what you times it by 2 and add 30 to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit. And you take away 30 and divide by 2 for Fahrenheit to centigrade. That's so simple. I've just got to get that fixed in my brain now. Thank you, Sandy. And I hope that's helped a few other people as well.
Now there's a moment when you come back through the front door from holiday, when you wonder what is going to greet you. Will your house have been burgled? Will the slugs have found their way under the back door and be munching on everything in your fridge? Or will an unexpected power cut have left everything in your freezer in a stinking mess? I guess I've got a bit of an overactive imagination when it comes to what goes on in my house while I'm away. But I did come back to 12 bottles of cottage cheese rather than milk because I forgot to cancel my milkman. Delicious. But much more important than that, how had my houseplants fared? I left mine for two whole weeks to go on holiday with my family and while we had a wonderful time I did miss them while I was gone and I was very relieved to come back and find that they were all still alive. Many of them I just left in their usual locations, watered them well before I went away and they were absolutely fine when I came back but some of the more sensitive and thirsty subjects ended up in the shower base of my office bathroom on top of a towel. Here's what I discovered when I went to check on them. So I've been away in Wales for two weeks and a lot of my houseplants got left here in the office in the bottom of the shower on a damp towel and now I'm back to find out how they've got on. Well, the first thing to say is a baby snail has decided to do some damage to my primulina. I think this snail either came in Uh, on one of the plants or possibly was already here because I do have a bit of an issue with uh, with snails coming in through the window into here Uh, as you can hear Wolfie's coming out to see what I'm up to hi Wolf Um, and so yeah most of the plants look absolutely fine they've all grown the my Brimulina Hisako is actually looking very well so that's good because that plant had been looking a bit miserable. So sometimes you can come back from holiday and find that the plants have actually improved because they've all been packed together in a small space. Lots of humidity and the benefits of being clumped together like that will produce some good results for some plants. I'll post a picture of this in my show notes so you can see what I'm talking about. So I've got lots of plants in here that are absolutely fine. Nothing has wilted. So the towel has obviously worked. The towel is still damp uh, and it stinks, to be quite frank. That's the only downside of this method. So this old towel is going to go onto my compost heap when I have taken it out of here. Um, So it will go on to have another life uh, serving uh, the serving as a little cap for the top of my compost heap. So let's have a look at what else we've got in here that's been surviving in my absence. There's one thing that is looking miserable is a Hoya cutting, which has gone very yellow. I'm not sure why that is, but Hoyas are pretty tough. I'm thinking that's going to be okay. Um, Unless it's got spider mite, which is possible. I'm going to have to get my hand lens out. I can see there's some stuff on the back of that leaf. It might be, in fact, that leaf's just come off in my hand. Uh, That might be spider mite. I'm going to do a bit of investigation on that one. That one's going to be put to one side. That means I need to have a look at all the plants, really, to check for things like spider mite. Um, Let's have a look at the other Hoya cuttings. The other Hoya cuttings are actually looking fine. This is DS70, and that's looking okay. But I will treat all of them with some a spray of houseplant defender just to make sure that they get a little boost once they move back to their normal locations. What else have we got here? Calathea mosaica, the mosaic calathea. Tough plant, actually. One of the toughest of the calathea clan. And this one is looking fine and dandy. I'm just looking for any sign of spider mite because, as we know, calatheas are very, very vulnerable to this. Can't see any signs of it. We'll check it with a hand lens also. It's got a couple of little crispy leaves. I'm not quite sure what's caused that. That might have been caused actually previous to my holiday from being in a little bit too much sun when it was really bright. But only a couple of leaves affected and there's some new leaves coming through. So that's great. So all in all, this has been successful as it usually is. Um, I'm yet to find any plants that are have died as a result of this method and things like well all of these plants in here there's lots of gesneriads there's phytonia there are lots of strawberry saxifrage oxalis babies and various other things they all seem to be 
pretty happy so this has worked really well and as i say uh, the plants inside are fine too let's go in and see how they're doing well, I'm now in the sunroom where a lot of my plants live and well I've got my folding ruler out because the headline news while I was away is that my variegated Monstra Deliciosa are, oh, they've gone a bit wild to be quite honest, I potted them up not long ago and the leaf that's unfurled on one of them while I've been away, well I'm just going to do a bit of measurement here so the previous leaf was about here we go uh 23 centimeters that's um 12 inches across the new leaf the next leaf that's opened is about 33 that's about thir 33 centimeters that's 13 inches across so it's gone exponentially bigger while i've been away and i've got the first leaf that's actually got a self-contained hole if you if you can imagine that so th there's a, a hole that's completely surrounded by uh leaf flesh as opposed to just being a cut into the outline of the leaf so that is mega exciting i think it's very happy that it's in a bigger pot and the other one well it's hasn't it's in the process of throwing out an, a new leaf and unfurling it uh it's not yet open but that's also doing really well so that is fantastic news this is what happens when you go away for two weeks exciting things occur and everything else well everything else is okay too my lovely smithy anthers uh two of them have broke into bloom while i've been away uh these lovely foxglove like bells that they produce which are absolutely lovely and everything else is, is hasn't been too bad um, i'm afraid i've got a little bit of spider mite on my maranta lemon lime which is a bit tragic but that won't take long to get rid of and everything else is looking fine and dandy and one of the plants that is looking particularly good is my oxalis triangularis which is what i want to talk about today and seeing as i'm here standing in front of it i just wanted to give you a little bit of a live experiment because one of the things i wanted to say about the purple false leaf shamrock as its common name is is that this plant is edible so these trifoliate leaves where you've got three triangle shaped sections to the leaf uh, are edible they do contain oxalic acid, which in large quantities can be problematic for some people. But to be quite frank, you'd have to eat a lot of these leaves to have a problem. So I don't think that's a concern. If you want to try eating your oxalis triangularis leaves, then please do. They're a member of the wood sorrel family, so they are edible. Just make sure that your plant is not a newly purchased one and that the leaves that you're eating are ones that have been produced since you bought it. That means that it's had time to get rid of any things that have been put on the leaves like leaves like leaf shine or anything else. Um, so yeah, with a new plant, I wouldn't eat a brand new plant. I'd wait for six months or a year so that you know what's happened to that plant and whether the leaves are going to be uh, we're going to be coated in anything or containing anything that you wouldn't want to eat. So here we go. Oxalis triangularis. Let's eat a leaf. Mmm. Oh, sir. Mmm. Oh, yes. Now, if you've ever eaten something that's lemony sour, that makes your mouth pucker, and one of your eyes close, then that's, in essence, what it's like eating an oxalis triangularis leaf. It's a wonderfully lemony, sour flavour. Also a little bit sweet too. Uh, a bit like eating a, a sorrel leaf. Absolutely delicious on a salad and stunning looking too. So do bear that in mind if you're growing Oxalis triangularis. It's not something you'd want to be chomping on all the time because you wouldn't have many leaves left. But it's a nice little treat occasionally to have on your salad. And of course, as you take more leaves out, more will grow in their place that's the wonderful thing about this generous plant right back to the podcast studio for more oxalis triangularis chat so we've discovered that the false leaf shamrock is edible what else do we need to know about this plant? Well, Oxalis triangularis actually comes in two colours. The purple leaf version 
is the most commonly grown by far as a houseplant, with the less than tongue-friendly Latin name Oxalis triangularis subspecies Papillionacea. The green form is just known as Oxalis triangularis, but there is some confusion over the naming of this one, and you will find the purple version called Oxalis triangularis purpurea and various other names. But Papillionaceae, well, that just means papillion butterfly, reflecting the way that the leaves look. And one of the other things that draws people to this plant is the colour of the foliage, which is the darkest, most dramatic purple with a paler purple splodge in the centre of each leaf, which catches the light in the most beautiful way. Well, another wonderful quality of this plant is its ability to perform nictinasty. It's not rude, don't worry. This is a clean podcast. Nictinacy just means the plant's ability to manoeuvre its leaves to make best use of the light during the day. So this plant kind of opens up like an umbrella as the sun comes up and maximises those butterfly-shaped leaves to get the most light. And then as the light starts to reduce at the end of the day, those leaves fold back down when they're not really needed so much. And it's a wonderful thing to see on your plant. Of course, one of the other plants that we see do this a lot is the Maranta group plant, the prayer plant. But Oxalis triangularis does it in a slightly different way. It does feel more like an umbrella than a pair of hands opening and closing in prayer. And I think it's rather charming. What else do we need to know about this plant? Well, like the strawberry saxophage that we talked about in episode 104, this is one of a very small group of houseplants that can grow successfully outside and inside whatever the weather in the British climate. So it's a hardy plant. It will die back outside in the winter and lose all its foliage, but it has a hidden superpower and that hidden superpower is the scaly rhizomes that grow underground. They're like storage organs that store resources for the plant. So if it does die back, either because it's been underwatered perhaps inside as a houseplant or because the conditions aren't right outside in the garden, then it can easily regrow from those rhizomes. And in fact, buying these tiny scaly rhizomes is the most economical way to get hold of this plant. You sometimes see it sold in, well, quite cheap jack kind of shops. Also, garden centres sell it at certain times of year as an outdoor plant. And for a couple of quid, you should be able to get hold of a few rhizomes. Or if you see a fellow houseplant grower with this plant, then do beg a couple of rhizomes from them because very quickly you'll end up with a full and lush plant that way. The leaves rise up on very straight, juicy stems, And it's worth saying that the leaves themselves don't last an awfully long time individually, maybe a few months maximum. So once they start to look a bit miserable, you can just literally have a little yank at the leaf and pull away the whole stem and leaf intact. And that doesn't cause the plant any problems at all. Oxalis triangularis is very much a foliage plant. It does produce little pink flowers, which I think could be accurately described as insignificant. You have a choice, really. Do you want the plant to put energy into flowers or into foliage? In my case, I pull off all of the flower stems because I just don't think they're that attractive and I want the plant to concentrate on putting out foliage, but they're pretty enough. So if you forget to take some off then, or you just like them, then feel free to leave them on. What kind of light does this plant like? Well, it won't like sitting next to a cactus and being absolutely frazzled by direct sun, but it can cope with a variety of different conditions. Mine is in my sunroom, north facing, but a glass roof, so it gets tons of indirect light, which suits it very, very nicely. But it's a tough cookie. If the light isn't ideal, you might lose some leaves, but move it to a better spot and you'll find that it will revive itself by producing new leaves quite nicely. Potting mix wise, well, uh, some regular houseplant compost with a little bit of perlite added is usually what I do, although it will take to a variety of different settings. You know, it will survive as a garden plant in garden most garden soil. So really don't panic too much about that side of things. And water wise, well, give it a splash of water or a good soak once a week in the growing season and you should be doing OK. It is a very forgiving plant, which is the kind of house plant that I like. If your plant does completely die back or lose some leaves, this is most likely to happen in winter. Do not despair. 
I would definitely advise taking the plant out of its plot and checking those rhizomes. If they are firm and they don't feel like they're mushy, then they should definitely regrow come the springtime. So put them into some fresh potting mix and leave them just slightly damp and hopefully come spring as the light levels improve your plant will regrow. If your plant does die back it's worth taking out any of those withered leaves. They're not really serving any function once they've died back and they just make it look rather ugly so pull those out or cut them off at the base and that will help to stop any rot setting in. And remember the fewer leaves you have the less you need to water so if in doubt don't water your plant particularly in the winter this plant can go a long way towards being quite dry before it's actually going to die because remember the key is those rhizomes which are storing both water and nutrients for the plant and when it comes to propagating this plant well there's three ways rhizomes leaf cuttings or seed i'm really not sure why you'd bother with seed uh unless that's the only way you can get plants because it's so easy to divide this plant and so easy to take leaf cuttings as well i was really surprised that this worked but you can actually pull out a whole stalk stick it in water and it will root how incredible is that but the easiest 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 way is just to get some of those rhizomes and grow from there so be generous and if your plant has produced a lot of rhizomes then do split some up and give them to friends one final thing to say about this plant some of you may be uh, turning up your nose because in your part of the world this is considered an invasive weed I guess that's why it makes such a good house plant because it is fine contained in a pot. It's not going to take over your whole house. It can be invasive in certain situations in the garden. It's easy enough to get rid of, but it is a bit of a pain if you've got a lot of it. You just need to get rid of all those rhizomes. But to be honest, it's such a beautiful plant. I think I can forgive it its invasiveness outdoors because it is just so wonderful indoors. And it's worth saying there are other oxalis that you can grow as houseplants. Oxalis depii is the one that's often mentioned. In fact, I've just got some rhizomes of oxalis depii iron cross, which is a green false leaf shamrock with a dark maroon centre like an iron cross, which has just started growing, which is very exciting. And there's a few others, including oxalis volcanicola, which is a lovely little plant that is a quite good as a terrarium plant and we'll be hearing more about that in an upcoming episode on plants for terrariums in which I talk to terrarium plant specialist the violet barn. A shout out to my new Patreon subscribers since I've been away. There's been a flush of new arrivals on the Patreon scene including Maggie, Miriam, Martin, MJ, no, not everyone has to have a name starting with M to be a patron, but it seems that way. We've also got Nancy, Tabitha, Siobhan, Cordelia, Hannah and Jennifer, who all became legends, while Hannah and Pauline became crazy plant people. And thank you also to Michelle, who gave a donation via code-fi.com, which is perfect if you don't want to commit to a monthly payment, you just want a one-off if you're not sure how to join the happy clan of people who donate to On The Ledge, then pop over to my show notes at janeperone.com to find out how. Patreon subscribers of $5 a month or more get access to extra episodes known as An Extra Leaf and a Christmas mail out, which incredibly, I hate to say the C word only in September, but I'm already working on this. So that will be something exciting coming through the letterbox of everyone who is a legend or an on the ledge super fan come December. And it's time for question of the week, which came in on Twitter from Jason. And Jason posted a pic of a rather lacklustre looking Asplenium nidus chrissy, which I have to say doesn't look exactly as I would expect it to look. It doesn't have the forked leaves at the end of the leaves on this particular bird's nest fern. The leaves tend to fork out into sort of finger-like extensions from the end. I don't see that on Jason's plant, but it certainly does have some waviness to the leaves. So maybe I'm wrong, but there are a few different forms of Asplenium nidus out there. In fact, I think it looks more like one that I've seen called Crispy Wave. Perhaps that's what you've got instead of Chrissy, Jason. But anyway, this is not a 
an ID question, it's a cultivation question. And it doesn't really matter exactly what cultivar of the bird's nest fern you have, because the problem is the same. Jason tells me that he's accidentally watered the centre of the plant without thinking. Jason, you must always think when you're watering your plants. Not that I always do. I have to say sometimes water is flung at them from some distance while running past to deal with a moaning child. But, you know, in an ideal world, we'd all think long and hard about how we water our plants. But hey, life gets in the way. I understand, Jason. And Jason reports that now it is slowly rotting. Any advice to save it? Well, it's a good piece of advice not to water the centre, the crown of any plant, be it in the garden or in a pot. But it's it's often worse in a pot because the water doesn't really have anywhere to go. Oftentimes when you water the crown of a plant, that water will sit there. And particularly in a bird's nest fern, the water will just hold, be held by the leaves and the position they're in and rot the plant and I think that's what's happening here. Obviously if you've got a bromeliad where it's designed for that kind of of, of watering then that's a different matter but for a bird's nest fern like this it's not going to like having water sat on top of it for any length of time. So really the advice is generally with these plants to either water from below or to water very carefully around the plant rather than onto the crown. So what can Jason do? Well, I'm looking at the picture and I can see that several of the leaves have got brown, soft parts at the base showing that there is rot occurring. The thing that's hard to tell from looking at these photos is whether it's just those few leaves that have taken the brunt of the damage or whether the actual growing point of the plant itself is rotten. I think the only way you're going to be able to find out, Jason, is by snipping away those leaves that are rotten at the base because they they just won't survive and then taking the plant out of its pot and having a really good look at that growing point, the centre of the plant. Is it all nice and firm and green or does it feel brown and mushy? If the latter, I suspect you may be in serious trouble. Either way, cut off any leaves that you think might be affected and see what happens next. And you'll also need to check the roots of the plant, Jason, just to check there's no rot going on there. But I suspect if, as you said, if the water's coming at the top, then it's more likely to be crown rot than root rot. So, but check it all out while you're there. There's no harm in doing that. Some ferns have an amazing ability to regenerate once their leaves have either gone crispy from dryness or, or rotted. They will regenerate incredibly. Uh, I don't know in this case whether that will happen with your fern, Jason but it's definitely worth a try. As I say, just ferns generally are one of those groups of plants that just respond really badly to watering errors, which is why, quite frankly, I don't grow many of them because I just ain't got the time for that kind of diva activity. But if you love ferns, this is something you need to bear in mind. Uh, Maybe put it in a self-watering pot or maybe put um, a note on it or make some kind of reminder so that you remember not to water this plant from above. I guess one thing you can do to make that easier is just make sure it's got a decent saucer underneath it that will hold water so that you can water it from below without too much hassle. Um, I hope that's helped, Jason. It's a lovely looking plant and I really hope it does pull back for you. I have heard many stories of ferns recovering from various kinds of, I don't want to say abuse because that sounds a bit harsh, but various kinds of problems, (laughs) cultural problems, as we might say. So let's cross our fingers and hope that yours will be fine. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, I do want to hear from you right now because I am in the throes of planning a Q&A episode. So drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com and I will endeavour to answer your question. Well, that just about rounds up this week's show. 
It just remains for me to remind you that on September the 21st and the 22nd, I'm going to be at Cactus World Live at Lullingstone Castle in Kent. I'm doing a podcast recording at 1.30 on the Saturday the 21st, and I'm doing an audience with Jane Perone at 2 o'clock on the Sunday. And I'm also planning a get-together of On The Ledge podcast listeners. So if you're planning to come, please let me know and we can arrange where and when we're going to meet. I'm also taking plant, I mean taking part, although that is a rather apposite slip of the tongue, in the Houseplant Festival at the Garden Museum in London the following weekend, that's September the 29th. I'll put details of both these events into the show notes and I'd love to see you if you can come. Right, and now I'm off to go and shove that stinky old towel on top of my compost heap for the wood lice, slugs and other tiny creatures to enjoy. Take care, everyone. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops. Brand New World by Kai Engel. An instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin. And Quasi Motion by Kevin MacLeod. All licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details. <laughs>